Uh, so uh, let's get started here. Today I'm going to talk about an important and deep subject, how to hack Tamagotchis. I've been looking at Tamagotchis for the past couple of years, trying to reverse engineer them to dump their code and figure out exactly how they work. Today I'm going to tell you a bit about what I've learned, both about hacking and about Tamagotchis. But before we begin, a bit about me. By day, I'm a security researcher at BlackBerry, and you'll notice there's a bit of a disclaimer in there. Well, I really wish my day job involved hacking Tamagotchis, it rather unfortunately does not. I studied electrical engineering in school, but I really learned about making hardware, not breaking hardware. So this was really my first foray into reverse engineering a device. So what are Tamagotchis? Just in case anybody doesn't know, they're the same virtual pet toys you remember from the 90s. You might remember kids running around with them, you press the buttons to feed them. But, well, the functionality is basically the same. As time has gone on, Tamagotchi life has become much more complex. Well, in the 90s, Tamagotchis just had to sit there and be fed and be cl cleaned up after. Nowadays, Tamagotchis make friends, go to school, have jobs. And if they don't get that all right, they can forget about getting married or having kids. And how do they do this? Well, it's through an IR interface. So if you have two Tamagotchis, you can pick them up and make them talk to each other. And they can become friends. Now, the specific Tamagotchi I looked at is called the Tamatown Tamago. It was the Christmas Tamagotchi from 2010. And it has a couple of differences compared to previous Tamagotchis. First, it's a lot larger, just so little kids can play with it with their fingers. Um, also, it has these figures that go on top. And what, when you slide a figure on top of a Tamagotchi, it unlocks all sorts of special functionality, like restaurants your Tamagotchi can eat at, or stores they can shop at. So what did I want to do with these Tamagotchis? Well, I really wanted to dump the Tamagotchi code. I wanted to answer what I called the deeper questions of Tamagotchi life. You know, what determines what food a Tamagotchi likes? What determines what friends they'll make? And what determines what the Tamagotchi will become? Also, I wanted to make my Tamagotchis rich and happy, have the richest and happiest Tamagotchis out there. And I thought maybe I could modify my Tamagotchis and make them do different things. Maybe even make a TV Bigotchi. And finally, I just wanted to have fun. Because you know all those cool kids going out, going to clubs? They just haven't discovered reverse engineering yet. <laughs> and one last idea, which was totally not mine. I take no responsibility for this idea. The idea of decoding IR and eventually running around and having my notebook impregnating innocent Tamagotchis <laughs> amuses me greatly. So I've been working on this for a while, so I'm just going to breeze through my past work and then move on to what I've been doing recently. So when I first got my Tamagotchi, when I went to the store and bought about six of them and said they were for a friend, I took my first one and I tore it apart and I figured out what was inside. And this is the board of a Tamagotchi. If you look at it, there's not a lot of really interesting stuff on there. The only persistent memory it has is the EEPROM, which is circled in red. And then you can see on the back, the microcontroller is covered by a blob of epoxy. And you can also see at the top the connectors for the figure. I also took about a, fig a part of figure, and that was even more boring. Some of them had an unpopulated PCB, and some of them had a blob covering some sort of chip. So after that, I knew that the microcontroller must be under that blob because there's nowhere else for it to be. So I went to try and identify it. I tried a bunch of really crazy methods to try and remove the epoxy. And eventually, Travis Goodspeed kindly offered to decap the chip with acid. So I got a die that looked like this. And after a fair amount of searching, I found that it was a, a general plus MCU. So the features here is that it runs 6502 like a Commodore. It has some RAM, it has some ROM, it's a grayscale LCD controller, has SPI, which is what's used for talking to the figures, and it has an audio DAC, which I'll also call an SPU. So at this point, I really wanted to dump the mask ROM that was in the MCU. That's the other thing I forgot to mention about it. It uses mask ROM, which is pretty much burned into the transistors, so there's no way you can modify the code of a Tamagotchi. 
you can only dump it because all the code is pretty much burned in. So I had a few ideas of how I could dump it. One of them was I could restore a bad state from the EEPROM, but I tried that and it didn't go very far because it was all serialized data. I thought maybe I could look for test functionality, maybe I could exploit a vulnerability in the figure or I are processing, maybe I could read the, read the ROM with a microscope, or maybe I could somehow dump it by manipulating pins. So I went through a few of these and gave them a shot. One of the things I looked for at first was the general plus test program. I found in the MCU data sheet that every version of this has a test program that can dump code. So I contacted General Plus and you know, told them that I owned a toy company who found our MCUs underpriced and I really wanted to know about this, especially the test program. And they didn't bite and I looked all over and I didn't find it. So I had to move to other measures. So I thought one possibility was to use this figure ROM, right? Because these figures, when they make you know, your Tamagotchi eat at a restaurant, I thought, you know, best case, they could have code in them. Or worst case, you know, maybe there is something that could be exploited to execute code. So, I, so my first step was to figure out what they were. And in a Tamagotchi, there are actually three types of figures. There are what they call light figures, which are they pretty much just have jumpers in them. And they'll unlock lock functionality that is already in the Tamagotchi, things that are already in the internal MCU ROM. And then there are what they call full figures, which those ones have some sort of memory in them that makes it serve up the restaurant or whatever. And then there turned out to be a third type, which I'll tell you about later, which are called wave two figures. So I took a look at these, and one thing I thought was interesting was that they had the unpopulated PCBs in some of them. And you can see up there, I scratched off the traces and I managed to identify it from a data sheet as a general plus SPI ROM. So then I knew what all the pins were on the figures. So then I made this um, circuit that didn't work very well. You can see it has very long wires, but I managed to dump the ROM and I decoded it into images and eventually I was able to figure out all of the ROM. Now, what was rather unfortunate was that there was nothing that was really code in this ROM. I found that almost all of it was images and the rest of it was more of a serialized format. And at this point, I couldn't obtain any sort of compatible flash. I looked into it and General Plus was like, no, you need to buy at least 100,000 units for us to sell it to you. So I used an MCU board, an SMT32F4 discovery board, and I simulated the ROM. And at this point I could do a few cool things, like that's just my picture on a Tamagotchi and my initials on a Tamagotchi. And from this I could also figure out what exactly it was reading when it used the ROM. And this is where it got more interesting. I found that the Tamagotchi actually reads less than 50 bytes of non-image data when playing a game. Which, what, what this actually meant was that all the game logic is actually internal to the microcontroller in the Tamagotchi. So it's not like it's fetching the logic off the figure then executing it. It's actually just fetching it turned out to be two codes and that would tell it the logic. And then it was actually just getting the images from the figure. So that was a bit unfortunate. But then I started changing these codes and I found that I could get to screens that weren't intended. So if I, for example, you know, incremented it by 10, I would get to the screen where you fed your Tamagotchi. And if I incremented it more, I would get to the screen where my Tamagotchi died. And then that was unfortunate and I had to restart it. But it was interesting. That pretty much meant that Tamagotchis are one big state machine and I could go anywhere with these codes. And what was more interesting was that if I jumped to an invalid code, the Tamagotchi would quite often just freeze and require a reset. But I didn't quite know what this meant yet. So here's one, one example of what I could do with this. Um, this is um, using an invalid code to make my Tamagotchi evolve or grow bigger. So the N is my really terrible excuse for a sprite.
point I could cheat at Tamagotchi, you know, make my Tamagotchi bigger and that sort of stuff. But I still didn't know really what I wanted to know, which was the internals of exactly how it worked. So I wanted to play more. But at this point, um, I talked at CCC, and I heard back from a couple of people who had ordered figures to try out what I was doing. But the figures they ordered ended up being these Wave 2 figures, and they included Flash. So that made everything I was doing much easier because I could just reprogram the Flash. And you'll notice in this picture I have a wire in there. That's actually not necessary. I didn't want to open up a second one to take a picture after I'd already wrecked this one by adding a wire. But pretty much the way they are, they have all the pins available to be writable. So I made a Flash programmer and so did a couple of other people. This is a guy called Mr. Blinky's Flash Programmer. There is a switch in there, and he can put his Tamagotchi into program mode versus regular mode. This is a guy called Asterix Programmer. And um, this is my programmer. <laughs> but it works, I promise. So another thing I want to look into, having already looked into the games, was the concept of items. Because when you use a Tamagotchi figure, one thing you can do is if they have a store, you can buy an item and use it later. And you know, the t Tamagotchi items are all sorts of things. You can see at the bottom of this slide, there's clothing from the clothing store that your Tamagotchi will wear. Or you can even take your Tamagotchi on a trip to Washington, D.C. and see the statue of Abraham Lincoln. So I wondered how they did this. So I looked into it, and unfortunately, it turned out to be, once again, a serialized format that you could use um, to put images on the screen to play sounds, but not a lot else. So there were some cool things I could do with this. For example, I could make my Tamagotchi do the Harlem Shake. was I couldn't execute code, so I started looking at this game logic again. And I started thinking about, you know, what might actually be happening when I jumped those invalid codes. You know, if I was freezing, maybe I could use it to execute code. And I also started to look into 6502 and what some of its properties were. And what I found out was very interesting. For example, for um, 6502 memory, and actually I'm just going to say most memory because there is one exception here, is mapped into a single address space. So that's good. There's no MMU. You know, no matter where you are, you can access any memory you want. The other thing is that there's no exceptions from accessing invalid memory. If you access an invalid address, it will resolve. It will resolve to an undefined value, but it will resolve. So that's actually quite useful for exploitation because it means basically you will never crash. You might get stuck in a loop, but you don't have to worry about if you get into a bug you know, too much that you will end up eventually crashing the device. That just can't happen. And invalid instructions, that's another thing you might expect to cause an exception, except it doesn't. An invalid instruction in 6502 will do undefined behavior for an undefined amount of time, but it will eventually move on. And the other thing that's interesting is that reset is rare. It's actually, I never had a situation where I didn't jump to the reset vector where the device just reset because I was in a bug. So my first attempt here was I thought, well, how about, let's just assume that this is one big jump table and I'm RTSing into memory. Well, if I'm going to an invalid address, well, maybe if I fill out my LCD with shell code, I'll eventually jump there. So I made an op sled. Um, I did find a way to make my Tamagotchi not walk in front of it and ruin everything. And then I just hoped. And I hoped and I hoped and I tried all the values, which took a rather long time. But unfortunately, nothing executed my shell code. But I did notice some strange behavior, which was there was one code, CC, where if some of the LCD RAM was set, it would buzz. 
But if I didn't set that LCD RAM, it would not buzz. And the other thing I noticed that was interesting was there were some invalid indexes that actually did valid things. So my second theory, which unfortunately turned out to be absolutely wrong anyhow, was that the, the jump table was always valid, but I was getting some sort of stat confusion. At which point, it started to bug me, because I thought with 255 values, this should work. Why isn't it working? So I went and I looked into my shell code again, and rather unfortunately, I was using the wrong instruction set. It turns out there are two general plus instruction sets, um, regular 6502, which is what everything runs, and their own 6502, and it turns out, I assume they are using the proprietary one, but they actually switched over to regular 6502 at some point, and that was what my shell code should actually be in. So at that point, I started trying again, and the fourth index I tried executed code. So this is an example. It is possibly the lamest POC you will ever see, but basically the stuff circled in blue, that was my stub, that is where I'm jumping to through the NOP slide. The thing circled in yellow is actually my shell code. And then what the shell code does is it just writes um, white to the thing circled in red. So I saw that happening and I knew I had code execution. So now that I had code execution, well, I wanted to make sure I got the ROMs right away so that I could figure out what was in the Tamagotchi's soul. So I wrote code that dumped the entire, entire memory space and I output it over SPI um, using the pins that were the buttons, that is port A on the General Plus MCU. And I decoded the output on a signal analyzer. And just to warn you, since these were meant to actually be input ports, I think doing this for long enough will eventually damage your Tamagotchi, but since I just did it for a short period of time, it worked out fine. And for this, when I did the first um, dump, I got most of the code. But as I said, there's the one time where the memory of the 6502 chip changes, and that's what's called ROM paging. Since um, a 16-bit space um, isn't large enough for most devices, most of them will support what are called ROM banks, then when you write to a certain register, it will change what's in certain values of ROM. So I didn't have a data sheet that would tell me um, where or how you would change this, so I started analyzing the code I did have, and eventually I found that it was writing to this location, 0x3000 a lot, and eventually I figured out that this must be the paging port. So I changed my code to write to it, and I ended up dumping all 19 pages. And then from inspection, I could quickly identify what they were. Zero to six were code, seven to nine were blank, page 10 contained a pointer table to images, 11 to 18 contained image data, and page 19 contained something I actually still haven't identified, but I assume has to be audio data, because otherwise, where is it? So here I have some of the images I got from my code dump, and at the bottom are the cutest highlights. So at this point, I wanted to reverse the ROM, and this was actually fairly difficult. It's kind of funny, in doing this project, one of my most frequently asked questions is, can I have the data, ship, data sheet for the chip? And what's funny is I actually don't have it, which makes reverse engineering way harder, because I don't know what any of the ports are or where any of them are located. So to try and work this out, I wrote a simulator. It was based on something called Pi 65, 6502 emulator. And I, from that, I was able to figure out where some of the ports were and where the LCD RAM was. And I slowly decoded the secrets of Tamagotchi life. And then a guy called Asterix, he actually ended up writing a way better simulator that will actually run in your browser. And this is I'm completely amazing. So if you ever want to just simulate the Tamagotchi and figure out what it does in certain situations, I'd suggest you just load this in your browser, and it's quite great. So looking at this, found out how the Tamagotchi internals worked. Basically, once a Tamagotchi starts up, it turns out it is one big state machine, and it has 41 different states, starting with it hatching, you know, go, going through it eating, going to school, all that stuff, and then of course the final state is it dying. And this is pretty much the only thing that controls the Tamagotchi behavior. The way the states work is every state will have an associated page, and then when you go to that state, it will bring up that page and then jump into a jump table in that page. And then as the Tamagotchi cycles through its loop, it will run the code on that page every single time. So from that, I was able to figure out 
some of the secrets of Tamagotchi life. For example, what makes a Tamagotchi a boy or a girl? Well, I found that was based on an entropy source at address C4, which is based on how many times a certain interrupt has fired. So when you start up your Tamagotchi, that exact moment that you hit the button to enter your name and stuff, that is what will determine whether it's a girl or a boy. Also, I found out that what toddler a baby grows into is random. So it actually doesn't matter how well you take care of a Tamagotchi baby. What it turns into doesn't really depend on that. Also, I found out that it is evened out, though. So if you have one toddler, it will remember what toddler you have. And the next time, you're much less likely to get that very same toddler. So I think it's just to make it more fun that you'll get a different character every time. What a toddler becomes, though, is based on how well you care for it. And I found out there was actually two factors that, you know, every time you feed it or whatever, or forget to feed it, you'll get dinged on those factors. And the same thing for what adult a teen becomes. But at this point, how well disciplined your Tamagotchi is also matters. And the other thing that I thought was interesting is that the toddler care affects what adult the teen becomes. So it's actually the whole lifetime of care that matters when your Tamagotchi is becoming an adult. And the other thing I thought was fun is that you can potty train your Tamagotchi. You know, when it needs to go, it'll start doing the potty dance, and if you drag it enough times, it'll just actually start going by itself, which I thought was kind of cool. Reduces the amount of care your Tamagotchi needs. The other thing that was cool was I uncovered a test mode. I was going through what happens when you put those figures on, and I found that there is one place where it branched to a different code, depending on what type of figure it was. And from this, when I put that figure on, it unlocked a Tamagotchi test mode. And this was really cool. It helped me figure out a lot about the Tamagotchi. You can see um, at the top, the heart and the person. Those are the two care factors I talked about. And then at the bottom are actually, there's two unused care factors. I can see it incrementing them like regular care factors, but they're never actually accessed. And actually, I found a lot of images in the Tamagotchi for characters that didn't exist. So I wonder if you know, they were planning on putting more characters in that depended on these care factors, and maybe they never got around to it. You can also change things. You can change what character you are, what spouse they have, how many figures you've attached, all that sort of thing. So this made me find out even more interesting things. For example, it doesn't matter who your Tamagotchi marries. No matter who, they're just as happy, and your kids turn out just the same. There's one exception to this, which is that if you marry a specific uh, Tamagotchi character called an Oldichi, you'll get a special child. But this is like a well-known secret character in the Tamagotchi that's been around for a while. Also, a lot of people were asking me, you know, if you keep your Tamagotchi with the figure on top, does that actually change how it behaves? And I couldn't find any evidence of that. You know, yes, if you open up the figure and feed your Tamagotchi some of the food, it gets less hungry, but just having one attached generally doesn't really affect anything. So what did I do? Well, I posted this on the Tamagotchi forum and got some interesting responses. For example, the forum cannot be held responsible if you do these tasks. These are your own choice at your own risk. And my personal favorite, interesting, you are putting much effort into something that most consider not worth it. Kudos to you. Ah, oh, well, what can you say? <laughs> so at this point, I thought, well, I have code execution. And I've dumped the code. But you know, I want to go further. I want to make it so that everyone can change their Tamagotchi and make it do fun stuff. So I decided I wanted to write a set of dev tools for the Tamagotchi. So, at this point, I'd already written two sort of dev tools. One which was just to put an image on the front of the Tamagotchi. And that was one of the first things I did when I figured out figures, just to make sure they worked. And the second thing I did was I made a script that will write a Tamagotchi music video. I showed you the Harlem Shake one already. I also used it to write a Tamagotchi Tears for Fears Mad World. You can look that up on YouTube if you want. It's quite long, so I won't show it to you now. But these both have serious limitations. They're actually both things that use the intended functionality of the Tamagotchi. And you're really limited into like, what they'll allow you to use. So I decided I wanted to write a tool that allowed generic 6502 execution. So my first step here was I needed reliable exploitation. 
because the vulnerability I'd used to dump the ROM, it actually only worked about 30 or 40% of the time, and that's actually very generous. I know there were days I was sitting there for like five minutes running it over and over until it would go. And I found that it worked better if the Tamagotchi had been running for a while. If I had a Tamagotchi sitting there and I picked it up, it would almost always work the first time. But if, as soon as I ran it a second time or a third time, it tended not to work. And this was really not ideal for a dev tool. I wanted something that works you know, 100% of the time so you can write something and it'll always run. So I started looking at my Vuln and trying to understand more about it so I can make it reliable. So I, at this point, I could see the code and actually understand what I was exploiting. And it turns out I was completely wrong about how it worked. My first guess was actually better than my second guess, but they were both wrong. Basically, it has a game index, and those are the things that it pulls right out of the figure ROM. And it sets the current state of the Tamagotchi to that value. And then the next time you go around the Tamagotchi loop, it'll jump into that state. And as I said, there are 41, or I guess hex 41 valid states, after which you'll jump into invalid states. And the error here you can see is that it just sets it to the current state and doesn't do any check that it's valid. And on a state change, what happens is the Tamagotchi will jump first into the state page table, which is a table that says what page that state is in. And then once the Tamagotchi knows the page, it will jump into the address, some um, hex 4000 into the, at that page. And then at the front of every page at that address, it has code that will jump into a pointer table for the function that is the beginning of that state. So if you have an invalid state, it could cause a jump to a non-code page, and it also could cause a jump to an unexpected address, or it could go to just an invalid page altogether. So when I looked at the vuln that I'd been using to dump Ron, it was actually very, very strange. The page table returned the value 3C, which is a completely invalid page because there's only 19 pages. And I thought, you know, maybe it was looping around, that maybe if you put something larger than 19, you go back to number one. But that actually wasn't what happen it happened. When I started playing with it, I figured out that it actually makes the memory at 4,000 float. You'll get back different values. And through some bizarre way, this was somehow causing a jump to the LCD RAM sometimes. But really, no wonder it was unreliable. And I didn't think it would be practical to ever make this unreliable, considering, make it, to ever make this reliable, considering that it depends on the values of floating memory. So I did what I called vulnerability idle. I wanted to pick the best vulnerability for my dev kit. So I tried different indexes, and pretty much what I started with was, let's try and find one that works three times in a row. And I tried, and then I started looking into what they did. And the best one I could find was index CD. And when I tried this one, I could figure out what happened. And basically, the page table returns a valid value, which is four, and that's actually part of the LCD table that comes straight after it. And then when it goes to page four, it jumps into the table at that index, except that index is actually code. And the code is the instructions inc 11 e but as data, it will resolve to the address 1EEE. -E -E. And that will actually resolve to the location of the LCD RAM. It's actually not the true location of the LCD RAM, but the LCD RAM, the way it works is that it actually ignores the top bit on its address, so it will cycle over and over. So you're jumping into something that's guaranteed to be the value of LCD RAM. So this is an exploit that will work 100% of the time. So at this point, I was able to write a dev kit. I put in a few things here. I put in I wrote what I called Tazimgotchi, which is the Tamagotchi assembler. It outputs b your um, binary code from your assembly directly onto the figure, so there's no fiddling around. You can just attach the figure and it will execute. It includes a lot of convenience functions, things like writing to the LCD and infrared, and it's based on an assembler called Office. Making the dev kit was a bit difficult. One of the real challenges is still I don't know what's in the data sheet. So there's a huge number of ports that I still don't know what it does. And really no one who doesn't work for General Plus knows what it does. 
I did end up determining a lot of functionality from the test program. You know how I mentioned that there was the general plus test program I was looking for? Well, once I had dumped the code, I was able to dump that program, and I was able to figure out what it did. And it would allow you to dump the code, it turned out. And it also had lots of different test features. So going through and being able to say, well, that one probably tests audio. That one probably tests the screen. I could guess at what some of the ports were. Even th then, though, there's still a lot of unknowns. I don't know how power management works. Unfortunately, ha I haven't been able to figure out sound and the watchdog, although thankfully it's not randomly resetting. So it's only if you wanted to turn on the watchdog and make it count down that you wouldn't be able to figure it out. And I just want to mention that uh, contributions are welcome. All the code is on GitHub right now, so if anyone ever figures these out, I would love to add them to the tool. I also made a board, um, I called it an eggshell, that you can use to program the Tamagotchi. It's got a few things in there. Um, it was supposed to be an Arduino clone, but some bad things happened in the Arduino cloning process and it sort of became a mutant. So um, don't expect to use your Arduino tools with it. But it does have code on there that you can use to program the Tamagotchi. I have SPI right now, and you'll notice it has IR on it. And that's because I expect in the future there may be remote Tamagotchi execution exploits, and I want to be prepared for when that happens. So anyhow, these are the tools um, I'm selling at the front. If you go to the front desk, you can buy a Tamagotchi with the board. And if you want to get started early, that's the address. It has all the tools in there, plus the board specs. And at this point, I'm going to do a random plug for my workshop. It's at 2 o'clock today. If you come with your kit, I'll show you how to use it. And I really think you should go. If you think about it, lots of workshops you go to. You know, we'll have other ones at other conferences and that sort of thing. But this is the only chance you will ever get to go to a Tamagotchi hacking workshop. So I think you should take advantage of the opportunity. So at this point, I have a demo. And this is just a basic demo of how the dev kit works. I'm going to say that I don't have a better demo because I didn't want to steal everyone at the workshop's thunder. But really, I just couldn't get my TV Bigotchi demo to work. So the way you execute code is that you play the game, then that's the shell code, and then there it's starting to execute the code that was in the dev tool. And then this is just a basic. It will display when you press the button what the button's name was. Um, so that is pretty much it. I managed to do a fair bit about the, with the Tamagotchis at this point. I learned about the Tamagotchi's internals. I learned a lot about the secrets of Tamagotchi life. I made my Tamagotchis do new things. And most importantly, good times were had by all, except for the Tamagotchis. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, that's it. I'm finished a bit early here. So we've got lots of time for questions. was have I looked at the cross Tamagotchi communication and yeah actually I did that a fairly long time ago it was one of the first things I looked at on the Tamagotchi before these things had come out so these were the previous generation and pretty much it wasn't that interesting you know I figured out that it will send basically the um, type of Tamagotchi you have and the code for the game you're playing and some sort of negotiation of whether you've won or lost and then based on that it like plays the game and then that's pretty much it. So I could do some very interesting things. You know, I could make my Tamagotchi infinitely happy. I could give it the most expensive gifts that you could imagine. But I don't think it was very likely that there was anything like um, code execution possibilities in there. Although recently I've started changing my mind on that. Now that, I'm, now that I've looked at the code, there is such a huge amount of it that I think it might be possible. But it, it wasn't anything obvious, like you could just stick code in there.
So a lot of the code execution stuff that I spotted from what you were putting up on the screen um, seemed to be from the fact that they were just arbitrarily trusting what you were giving to it, completely mm -hmm. trusted inputs. Um, is that something that you would tend to see in uh, other hardware that you looked at, assuming that you've looked at some other bits and bobs? Yeah, like, I'll admit my expectations here were a bit lower than what I found out. Um, I, you know, I was expecting there to be no checks whatsoever. And I did try some other things. Like I said, I tried the IR. I also tried reprogramming the EEPROM. And I was hoping to get, you know, out of bounds there somehow. But it was interesting. Those both had really good checks on them. And I thought it was because, you know, this is a children's toy. It's crummy hardware. Maybe they just don't want to, like, make a kid really sad by it crashing. But yeah, basically, um, of the code I've looked at, that is the only um, missing check I've found, which is quite surprising. Uh, do you think that this could have been an NSA backdoor in the Tamagotchi? <laughs> uh, there might already be one, but I can't talk about that. It's a secret subpoena. <laughs> okay, I guess that's it. So I'm just going to end off with... Um, Actually, I guess two more things here. Uh, this is my contact info if you're interested. As I said, I would love contributions. And anyone who is coming to my workshop, I'm really looking forward to helping everyone hack the Tamagotchis. And finally, since this project is coming to an end soon, I am looking for opportunities to hack other things, especially other cute things. So any suggestions, please tweet them at me. <laughs> Thanks.